Right guys, welcome to part two of the, uh, the May 2018 uh, GCSE paper from Maths World Education. Uh, so I had to stop the video in the last video. So if you haven't already seen part one, then be sure to check that out. And uh, what we'll do is go straight to question number 13. Okay, so we've got A, B, C, D, points on the circumference uh, of a circle, and we've also got centre O and F, D, E, which is the tangent to the circle. And we're asked to show that Y minus X is equal to 90. So first of all, how do we actually uh, go about doing something uh, like this? Well, what I'm going to do first of all, uh, I'm actually going to um, just draw a dotted line here. Uh, from B to D, which we can actually see uh, is also uh, the radius. Since B, so since BO uh, equals uh, OD, uh, we can see that the angle OBD uh, will be equal to BDO, uh, which would simply be equal to x degrees. So we can actually take that value and we can put an x degrees there also but what we also what we can also see as well that this angle all the way around here uh, is actually going to be equal to 2 times y okay and because what we also know as well is that hopefully most of you are aware that all the angles in the triangle add up to 180 degrees so if x degrees is this angle here, where at the point D, and x degrees is uh, the angle at point B, uh, then we can see at point O, uh, so I'm going to rewrite this, B O D must be equal to, uh, that's going to be 180 minus x minus x, which is 180 minus 2x. But what we so what we, we've got all the information now for this uh, this little circle that's going on here. So what we can do, and I'm sure all of you are aware of it, the the sum of all the angles in a circle is, is simply just equal to 360 degrees. So therefore, 360 degrees uh, will be equal to two uh, y uh, plus uh, this angle BOD, uh, which was 180 minus 2x. So now what we need to do is to gather all this information together now and see how we get on and what we actually uh, what we actually end up getting if we take the 180 to the other side we've got 180 equals 2y minus 2x. Now if you divide if you divide both sides of the equation by 90 uh, sorry by 2 uh, then you actually get 90 is equal to y minus x. And that is the, that is the result that it's asked us to uh, show. So we are all good. Let's now move on to part B. So it says, uh, Dylan was asked to find, uh, to give some possible values for x and y. He said, y could be 200 degrees and x could be 110. Because 200 minus 110 is equal to 90. Is Dylan correct? Well, what do we know about 200 degrees, first off? 100 degree, 200 degrees has to be equal to um, 100 and... It has to be more than 180 degrees, so that basically means that it must be a convex uh, angle. But look at this, look at y. Let's go back to the, the, the diagram. We know that all the sum of all the angles in a triangle must be equal to 180 degrees. So there's no way any of these angles could be any more than 180 degrees. So basically y has to be less than uh, 180 degrees. So I've just wrote uh, in the answer for part B, uh, is Dylan correct? No, Dylan is not correct. And uh, that's because, those little dots there mean because uh, y uh, degrees is an angle inside uh, a triangle. And uh, y is must be less than 180, therefore y cannot be equal to 200. It'd be impossible. Uh, time now to move on to question number 14. So it says the distance time graph shows information about a car journey. 
Uh, so here on the y-axis, we've got the distance traveled in meters, and along the x-axis, you've got time in seconds. Now it says, use the graph to estimate the speed of the car at five seconds. So the best thing to do, if you've ever got uh, a distance time graph like this, uh, the way you actually uh, measure uh, the speed any given time, uh, notice it's not the average speed. It wants it wants it wants to know it wants us to find out exactly what the speed of the car was going at exactly five seconds. And to do that uh, means having to do a, a tangent along uh, the curve at uh, time five seconds. So let's uh, draw a tangent and see how we get on. So we want to draw a tangent, and then what we want to do is. Uh, find out what the gradient is of uh, this tangent. So let's draw, let's just draw the tangent out here. So there we've got the tangent and, and the best way to find out the speed now is by uh, finding out what the gradient of this tangent uh, actually is. Alright guys, so um, yeah, as I said, uh, to find the gradient, you're dividing the uh, height by the width. So what I've done here, I've taken, I've taken this tangent here, and I can see, I can see from this point here all the way down to the bottom, we've got a difference. Just reading off the y-axis, we've got a difference of sixty. So the height here is sixty, and I'm just taking the difference between uh, seven seconds and uh, that was three point four just at this point here. So if we take the difference between seven and three point four, we've got three point six. So uh, if we divide uh, 60 by 3.6, that gives us 16.6 recurring, which is 16.7 meters per second. Uh, normally, with estimations and uh, that sort of thing, uh, normally uh, the examiner will allow for, it, for like a margin of error by quite a bit. So don't worry about um, don't worry about getting your sketch inch perfect. Uh, it doesn't have to be a work of art, but at the same time, make sure you use a ruler as well. Just de demonstrate that you've um, that you've tried to find the gradient the best you, uh, the best you could. Uh, and normally, I looked at the um, I looked at the exam uh, solutions actually for this question. And I can the more like the the range was from like eleven to nineteen meters per second. So you could your tangent could be all over the place, and you'd still uh, get the you'd still get the correct answer. So don't worry too much about. Uh, uh, your uh, sketches. Let's move on to the next question. Now, for question 15, it says a darts team is going to play a match on Saturday and on a Sunday. The probability that the team will win on Saturday is 0.45. Uh, best thing to do here, I'm just going to complete the probability tree here. Uh, the sum of these probabilities have to add up to 1. Uh, so if we subtract four, uh, 0 0.45 from 1, we've got 0 0.55 here. Uh, the team's not going to win on Saturday. If they win on a uh, Saturday, yeah, uh, the probability that they w will win on Sunday is 0 0.67. So we can stick a 0 0.67 here. So the chances that the team's not going to win must be equal to 0 0.33. Okay, uh, and then uh, if the team does not win on the Saturday, so the team spirit's quite low, you know, they might have lost a bit of confidence. Probability uh, that it will not uh, it will win on Sunday is uh, 0 0.35. So we can stick a 0 0.35 here. The team would win on Sunday if they don't win on the Saturday. And if they don't win uh, again on the Sunday, on the condition that they didn't win on the Saturday, uh, we can see uh, the probability of that is going to be 0 0.65. So we can see here that the probabilities here have to add up to 1. The probabilities here have to add up to one, and here they have to add up to one. Any event uh, that you take into consideration, the probabilities have to add up to one. Okay, because basically the team it's either going to win or it's not going to win. Uh, okay, there's no, there's nothing in between. Okay, um, not win. That's obviously if it's, so. If, if, so if there's a draw, team's still not going to win. Now. Uh, let's. It says here find the probability. So we've completed the tree diagram. Now it says find the probability that the team will win exactly one of the two matches. So we've got two possibilities here. Either the team's go either either the team's going to win, 
on the Saturday and then not win on the Sunday. So let's find out the probability of that. That's going to be 0.45 times 0.33. Uh, and the probability of that outcome is 0.149. So we've got 0.149, three significant figures. Uh, the second possibility uh, is a team doesn't win on Saturday but wins on the Sunday. So to do that, again, we times uh, 0.55 this time by uh, 0.35. And that's going to give us a probability of 0.19. Uh, 0 0.193. Uh, 193. So to find the probability of uh, those two matches, uh, we're just adding these two values together. So, so the probability uh, that we win uh, only once. So we've got the probability. Uh, that we so we win on Saturday, uh, but not win on Sunday, and then adding the probability uh, that we win on Sunday, but we don't win on Saturday. So we're just adding these two values together. We've got zero point one nine four plus 0 0.193. I'll just work uh, that out. And that gives us 0 0.342. And uh, now we have it, that's our probability. Now let's look at uh, question 16. So on the grid it says draw the graph uh, x squared plus y squared equals 12.25. Um, uh, now, it makes sense, actually, if we uh, take the square root of 12.25. So using your calculator, you can see uh, the square root of 12.25 is simply equal to 3.5. So therefore, x squared plus y squared will be equal to 3.5 squared. And uh, whenever you've got... Whenever you've got uh, an equation which looks like this. Normally, uh, if you've just got the x and you've just got the y and you've got no x or y terms, then that means uh, that the center of the graph will be at the origin. So that means we've got the origin just here uh, and we've got 3.5 squared, which is the same as 12.25. So the 3.5 is your uh, radius. So I'm just gonna draw this graph out now. Uh, so there we've got the sketch. Of, uh, of the um, graph, so it's not to scale, uh, but that's that's uh, sort of my idea of a circle. And then it says, hence find estimates for the solutions of a simultaneous equation. So we've got we've got x squared plus y squared equals twelve point two five, which is this curve here. And then we've got two x plus y equal, uh, equals one. Well, two x plus y equals one. Uh, what we can do, we can rewrite that equation. We can say, well, that's the same as y equals minus two x plus one, so we've just brought two x to the other side. Now what we can do, there's two ways of doing this. We can actually, uh, we can draw the graph y equals minus two x plus one, and then our estimates of the uh, solutions would be the intersections. Uh, the, other, the other method is by, um, you could substitute, uh, you could substitute the second equation into the first, and then solve uh, solve the quadratic equation for x, and then substitute it back in to find y. Uh, but it's asking us to draw the sketch here for a reason, so let's go along with uh, the sketch and draw the line y equals minus 2x plus 1. Okay, so I've just drawn the line y equals minus 2x plus 1. Uh, we can see when x is equal to 0 uh, on the y-axis, it's actually going to intersect at y equals 1, just this point here. And uh, because it's minus 2x, we know that the gradient has to be equal to minus 2, so we can see... Uh, from this point here, from 1 to minus 1, uh, it's going to go down by 2 and then going across just by uh, just by 1 uh, since uh, the height divided by the width is equal to the uh, gradient. So the next thing we need to do now is to find out what uh, points uh, it actually intersects. So let's 
let's do just that and find some estimates here. So uh, at this point, just reading off, reading off this intersection, uh, reading off this intersection here, I can see that that's around about, uh, I'm going to go for minus one point, uh, I'm going to go with minus one point uh, seven if I was a betting person. So minus 1.7, uh, I'm going to go for. Hang on, what am I talking about? That's that's 1, sorry. That's going to be minus 1.3. And then the Y component uh, is going to be, uh, it's going to be 3.2. So therefore, we're going to have uh, minus 1.3 and 3.2. Uh, let's do the same on this uh, other intersection here. So here we've got this intersection here. I can see that the, the intersection's taking place here at uh, 2.2. And uh, for the Y component, uh, it looks like the intersection is at uh, minus 3.2. So therefore we've got 2.2 and minus 3.2 uh, for our intersection. So I'm just going to write out the uh, s-coordinate just here as well. 3.2 and then minus uh, 3. Sorry, I'm not having the best day today, guys. 2.2, uh, .2. that's more like it, isn't it? 2.2 .2. and then minus 3.2. Okay. Okay, let's move on now to the next uh, to the next question, question seventeen. So now we have got another graph question, but this time it's the histogram. Uh, so it says the histogram shows information about the times taken by some students to finish the pizza. Uh, so it it's giving you this table, and then it's also saying um, it's saying complete the frequency table. So uh, what we need to do, it, it tells us for this particular area that the frequency is 4. So that means the area of this of this bar, if you like, is actually equal to 4. So it makes sense, it makes sense, doesn't it, if we what we what we can see then here, if we split this up into uh, uh, into boxes like that, each of these different uh, boxes is actually worth an area of 1. So looking at um, looking at this uh, second interval here when t is between 5 and 15, which is this second uh, box here, what is our area going to be? And I can I can see already that the area here is actually going to be is actually going to be equal to 4. So we can write a 4 here again. And then for the next one, uh, this is going to be 4. Uh, I can see uh, that you've got a 1 there and a 1 there. Uh, so we can give this a six, and same again. We got we got one, two, three, four, five. So for the next interval, uh, we can give a five, and then I can see here we got we got one, two, three, four. Uh, so therefore, uh, we have four for our next uh, interval. And there we have it. Uh, that concludes our table. Now, for, B, for part B, it's saying find an estimate for the lower quartile of the times taken to finish the puzzle. So the best thing to do is to actually um, count up these frequencies and just find out exactly how many students participated in uh, in this study. So let's do that. Let's count. Let's uh, let's count up the the number here. So we've got what have we got? We've got total. Um, Total frequency was four plus four plus six plus five uh, plus four. And you can see that's equal to four plus four plus six plus five plus four. Uh, that's giving us a total of 23. Now it's talking about uh, finding an estimate for the lower quartile. So we want to, what we want to do in that case is divide uh, 23. Uh, by four and find out how we get on. 
So 23 divided by 4 is actually equal to 5.75. Um, since these are individuals that we're dealing with, uh, we can just estimate that and round it up to 6. So we're interested in what category the 6th person uh, from the lowest value uh, falls into. Well, we can see that we can see that we had a f frequency of four between zero and five, so the sixth person must uh, must occur between five and fifteen. So we know, we, like we know, then that the interquartile range has to be uh, between uh, since it's the time that it's asking us for uh, because the time's taken. Uh, we know it's going to fall into. We know that it's going to fall into this category here, so uh, what did we have? Uh, greater than or equal to 5, less than 15. So we take the middle point between 5 and 15, uh, which turns out to be 10 minutes. Uh, question 18. And as I say in all the videos as well, guys, if you've got any questions at all, please uh, leave me a comment in the comment section below. And I will do my best to uh, get back. Now, this is an interesting question. It's talking about cuboid here. Uh, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put all this. I'm going to put all this information here onto the get onto the, uh, the diagram. So we've got we've got 7.3 centimeters here between A and B. Uh, CH is equal to 8.1. And angle BCA. Uh, which is uh, just that angle here, and so B C A uh, is equal to forty-eight degrees. Now we're interested in finding uh, angle. What was it once? Here? It says find the size of the angle between A H and the plane A B. In the plane A B C D. So basically, what we need to do is we need to find the following, don't we? Let's draw a triangle out here. Of course, we've got a right angle here. So we've got A C and and H, and we we're interested in knowing what uh, angle theta actually is. C, do we know what CH is? You bet. Uh, it's 8.1. But we don't know what AC is yet. AC is something that we need to, uh, we, we actually need to find out. So I'm going to call that length uh, Y uh, just here. But can we find out? So we, we can't find out theta yet until we know what AC is. But can we find AC? Is that possible? Well, yes, it is because we have to go off this other diagram here that I'm going to draw out. Uh, so I'm going to draw out another diagram here where this is point A, this is point B. And we can see that the length here is 7.3. Uh, AC is what we are trying to find here, uh, which is Y. And we already know as well that um, the angle uh, ACB is equal to 48 degrees, so we've got 48 degrees here. So now we're actually using all the information. So how can we find out why here? Uh, and the thing to do is to use um, use Sokotoa. So what can we what can we see based off 48 degrees? What can we deduce about uh, this length 7.3? Well, we can see that that's actually equal to the opposite, can't we? So we can see that the opposite divided by uh, the hypotenuse is going to be equal to sine 48. Uh, so we've got 7.3 over y is equal to sine 48. So what we need to do now is to rearrange this equation to uh, determine uh, what the value y actually is. So y, uh, once you've rearranged everything, is simply equal to 7.3 over sine 48. And uh, what you actually end up getting is uh, this length here. You end up getting three significant figures, 9.823.
So what we can do, we can go back to this uh, diagram here on the left hand side and we can call uh, this length 9.823. Now can we find out what theta is? Yes we can. Uh, and we can actually use this formula. We can say well tan theta is equal to the opposites divided by the adjacent uh, which is going to be 8.1 divided by 9.823. So theta is going to be equal to the inverse tan of 8.1 divided by 9.823. And our angle uh, to one decimal place will be 39.5 degrees. So if you've got any questions about how I've actually come to that, uh, just like I say, uh, give me a comment in the comment section below. Question 19. So it says shape S is a quarter of a solid sphere center at the origin. Uh, the volume of S is 560, uh, 576 pi centimeters cubed. So looking at this, it's it's giving us it's giving us the volume of uh, this shape, which is a quarter of a sphere. Uh, but we need to find it the surface area. So what's the common denominator here? What do we actually need to find out? We, well, we need the radius to find out what the surface area is of the shape. But we don't know what R is yet, so we need to we need to use this information here. And what I can see, it's, it's a quarter of a shape, so we can see that 4S is actually equal to the volume of a sphere, which, uh, which is actually equal to Uh, sorry about this, I'm just getting some technical difficulties here. Uh, so that's the same as 4 thirds pi r cubed. So 4s, it tells, it tells you what s is here, doesn't it? So uh, that's going to be 4 times uh, 5, 7, 6 pi. Okay. Uh, 5, 7, 6 pi uh, is equal to 4 thirds pi r cubed. Now, the thing to do now is to actually uh, find out and do some calculations. So let's uh, let's do just that and see how we uh, see how we get on. Uh, so here we've got uh, 2,304 times pi equals 4 over 3 pi r cubed. So we can actually cancel out the pi's here, and we can see that r cubed is going to be equal to 3 times 2304 divided by 4. Uh, and that uh, comes to 1728. So for r we just get the cubed root of 1728, uh, which is 12 cubed. So the cube root is simply equal to 12. So now we've got the radius. Uh, it's saying, but it, it wants the surface area of S, not the surface area of the sphere. Okay. So there's there's three things we need to take into consideration here. We we need the we, we need the surface area of this semicircle here, the sur the surface area of this other semicircle. So it's it's basically the same as a as a circle if you think about it. The area of a circle because we're adding two semicircles together plus a quarter of what the surface area is of the sphere. So let's uh, let's focus on the, the outside surface area first. So the surface area of S is going to be a quarter of the surface area of the sphere plus uh, 2 plus these two bits here which is simply the pi r squared. Uh, so what we got? We got a quarter times uh, the surface area of the sphere. Uh, so that's going to be 4 pi times r squared, which is 12 squared, so that's 144. Uh, plus pi times r squared again, which is pi times 12 squared, which is uh, 144. This dot here just means it's times. Uh, so let's break this down. We've got a quarter of 4, which so the quarter cancels out of a 4. So we've got 144 pi plus 144 pi again, uh, which is 288 times pi. 
uh, but he wants it to three significant figures, doesn't it? So, 288 times pi uh, actually ends up being 905 uh, centimetres, and we've got to get the units right, surface area, so it's centimetres squared. Uh, and that's two, three significant figures. And there we have it, uh, guys, that is our final answer. Question 20. Uh, so a much easier one than, than the previous few questions that we've had. Uh, this uh, first bit, part A, is just worth one mark. So it says, Martin did this question. He rationalised the denominator 14 over 2 plus root 3. Uh, so this is how he's answered the question. So uh, let's have a look. What's he done so far? He's times the top and bottom by 2 minus root 3, which is absolutely fine. Uh, that's OK. Uh, he's multiplied out the brackets uh, on, the num on the numerator. We've got the 28 minus 14 root 3. That looks good. Now, uh, when we multiply out the brackets here, we've got 2 times 2, which is 4. So he's got that. We've got 2 times root 3, which is 2 root 3, minus 2 times uh, root 3, which he's got. Now, square root of 3 times minus square root of 3 is actually equal to minus 3. Uh, so... So he's made the mistake here. So 3 times minus root 3 is actually equal to minus 3, not 3. He's actually got a plus 3 here, so that's where he's, um, that's where he's gone wrong. Mm. Okay, let's move on to uh, part B. So Cian did this question. She rationalised the denominator 5 over root 12. So let's have a look at what she's done. She's, um, well, she's attempted to rationalise the denominator. She's times the top and bottom by root 12, which is absolutely fine. Uh, so we've got 5 times 3 root 2. This 3 root 2 looks pretty dodgy, doesn't it? Uh, and then we've got the 12 on the denominator. So I can see where she's gone wrong here. So root 12 is equal to the square root of... Um, that's going to be 4 times 3. And then if we take the 4 out, that becomes 2 root 3. Uh, so it's actually 2 root 3. It's not, it's not 3 root 2. Okay. So that's where, uh, that's where she's gone wrong, uh, just there. Okay. Let's have a look now at the final question, which is question number 21. There's no further questions, is there? No. So this question's worth five marks. So it says Jackson is trying to find the density in grams per centimetre cubed of a block of wood. Uh, the block of wood is in the shape of a cuboid. Uh, so these are the measurements. Uh, it's, so this cuboid here... So we've got we've got this going on here, not to scale. Uh, so the height is twenty one point seven. Uh, we've got a width of uh, sixteen point zero, and we've got a length of thirteen point two. Uh, okay, uh, it tells us what the mass is. Look at this. Co correct to the nearest five grams. By considering bounds, work out the density of the wood. So we need to we need to work out really what the upper and the lower limit is of the mass. Let's look at the mass first. What would be the low? What would be the lower bound of the uh, the mass? Uh, the lower bound is going to be nineteen sixty-seven point five grams. Okay, because it's to the nearest five grams, so you take half of that, and then that's uh, the low bound is half of the nearest five grams. It's two point five grams minus nineteen seventy, which is nineteen sixty seven point five grams. So that's your lower bound there for your mass. Uh, in the same way, your upper bound uh, is going to be nineteen seventy two point five grams to the nearest five grams. Because any any more than that, it's gonna go. It's gonna round up to nineteen uh, seventy-five. Okay. Now let's look at uh, volume. 
uh, our low bound uh, is going to be equal to again it's going to be length times width times height now for the length uh, what do we got uh, so we've got length 13.2 so the low bound for that is going to be 13.15 times the width which is going to be 15.95 times the height which is 21.65 okay so the volume uh, for that let's get my notes is going to be 1967.5 is it not no what am i talking about that's the mass uh, it's going to be four five four zero point nine two five Okay, you might now you might be wondering, well, why have you, why have you got all these decimal points here uh, when when we're just dealing with estimates? And the reason why is because it's based off the inf it's based off the information which you, you which you already which you already taken into account to be a lower bound. So plus it, it makes the working out more accurate when it comes time to measure uh, the density. So that's why I'm that's why I'm doing it like that. Let's talk about the upper bound uh, for the volume. Again, we've got length times width times height. So this time the length's going to be 13.25 this time uh, times 16.05 times the height, which is 21.75. So the upper bound uh, is going to become 4.625 0.409 so we've got what we've got now is upper and low bounds for the mass and the volume so first of all what's the what's the density going to be for the uh, upper bound well that's simply going to be the uh, the mass at its upper bound divided by the volume of its lower bound okay we want to make the density as high as it possibly can be uh, which means the denominator a low value will yield a higher answer for the density so that's uh, that's my logic there so what have we got for upper bound mass we've got 1972.5 divided by low bound volume uh, we have 4540.925 so that works out at uh, 0 0.434 uh, grams per cubic meter to uh, three significant figures. And what else have we got? We've got uh, the density lower bound is going to be the mass lower bound divided by the volume of the upper bound. Uh, so we're running out of space here, guys. Uh, that's going to be 1967.5. Uh, and that's going to be divided by 4625.409. And that works out at 0 0.425. Grams per meter cubed. So... It does actually go, you know, going back up to the top, it does actually ask us for an estimate, doesn't it? It's saying, please give a reason for your final answer. Give your answer to a suitable degree of accuracy. So that's quite that's quite a loose term, I think. So what can we what can we deduce based off these two possible answers here? Well, if you do it to two significant figures, uh, our final answer is going to be 0 0.3. And sorry, 0.43. And that's two uh, two significant figures. So that's our final answer. And the reason why is because it's two significant figures. Uh, that's basically the same. It's the same answer uh, when you're rounding two significant figures, whether it's your upper bound or your lower bound. And that's it. That's all you have to. I'm not going to write that down just because I've run out of space, but you get the general idea anyway. So I hope you found that helpful anyway, guys. 
Um, if if you've got any questions, leave me a comment section. Comment, uh, leave me a comment in the comment section below. Uh, please uh, leave a like as well and subscribe so you're notified on any further content uh, that I come out with. Uh, anything else you want me to talk about, uh, just let me know. Thank you very much and see you in the next video.